Today we begin in Psalm 148, and we conclude at Psalm 150. And uh, normally, just so that you know, when I do my study in the, in the book of Psalms, I normally have three full pages and then a portion of a fourth. Today I only have two pages. So that means either this is going to be a very short Bible study, or I'm going to tell you a whole lot of stories and give my testimony somewhere in it. <laughs> but beginning yeah, again, um, this... <laughs> I heard that. Beginning at verse 1. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you stars of light. Praise Him, you heavens of heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded and they were created. He has also established them forever and ever. He has made a decree which shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all the depths, fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy wind, fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruitful trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying fowl, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all judges of the earth, both young men and maidens, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above the earth and heaven, and he has exalted the horn of his people, the praise of all his saints, of the children of Israel, a people near to him. Praise the Lord. And so as I was mentioning to you when we began this last section of the Psalms, I mentioned to you that the Psalms from Psalm 146 to Psalm 150 are called Hallel or Praise Psalms. And one of the reasons, and the most obvious reason that they are referred to in that way is because each one begins with the phrase, Praise the Lord. And also because each one concludes the psalm with the same phrase, praise the Lord. So you see that in Psalms 146 to the concluding psalm, Psalm 150. Therefore, these are known as praise psalms. This is praise and this is worship to the Lord. And, and we need to remember that that's what we have been created to do. If somebody wants to know the purpose that they have in life, the purpose that we have in life is to praise and worship the Lord. It's been said that man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That's why you were created, is to glorify the Lord and to enjoy Him. And so in fellowship, we enjoy Him. In our life, we glorify Him. In this particular psalm here, Psalm 148, all of creation is called upon to praise the Lord. Notice he speaks of the heights. When he says, praise the Lord from the heavens, praise him in the heights. When he speaks of the heights, it speaks of heaven. It would be speaking of the throne room of God. When he speaks of the angelic host, that's all the unfallen angels. When he speaks of the heavens, praise him, you heavens. It's the sun, the moon, the stars in the starry heavens. They're all called to, to praise the Lord. It's, and he continues and says, the waters above the heavens are to praise the Lord. That would speak of the clouds in what is called atmospheric heaven or the skies. And the whole point that he's making is praise the Lord, and praise begins first and foremost in heaven and the heaven of heavens. And so all of creation is being called on to praise God, to, to say how wonderful he is and all. He says in verse 5, let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded they were created. He has also established them forever and ever. He has made a decree which shall not pass away. And so he's making it very clear in verse 5 that praise to the Lord is due to the Lord because he is the creator of everything. He created all things. In Psalm 33, we read in verses 6 through 9, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters and the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. So you praise the Lord, verse 5 tells us. You praise the Lord because he has created all things. Verse 6 says, He has also established them forever and ever. He has made a decree which shall not pass away. We also praise him because the universe is regulated and the universe has an order to it. And this orderly universe 
is so because God has remained true to his word. And so all creation is under the authority of God, and therefore we praise him. When he says in verse 7, Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures in all the depths, fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy wind, uh, fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruitful trees and all cedars. He continues to speak there concerning creation. In verse 10, be, uh, beasts and all cattle, creeping things, flying fowl. We praise him because uh, everything is under him. All things are subject to his word. So he's speaking here concerning stars and the moon and the sun and the angels and, and even trees and, and cattle and everything. But in verse 11, we see that he speaks concerning mankind, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all judges of the earth, both young men and maidens, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above the earth and heaven, and he has exalted the, the horn of his people, the praise of all his saints, of the children of Israel, a people near to him, Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Why should I praise him? I praise him because he's revealed himself to us. I've praised him because he could have chosen to remain hidden from us, but he didn't. God chose to reveal himself to us. Now, had the Lord decided to remain without us having opportunity to or ability to know him, it wouldn't have been difficult at all for him to do that. God is the kind of God that is very capable of hiding himself from men. Isaiah says, surely thou, art, surely thou art a God that hidest thyself. You know, God could, if he desired to, remain uh, in such a way that you and I, that mankind could not find him out. His ways are past finding out. We can't know God. The Bible makes it very clear just through the ascertaining of, of information and then putting it together in some logical kind of way and coming to a conclusion that, that there is God, therefore I know him. You can't know him that way. God has to reveal himself to us, and he does so by his Holy Spirit. Now, God has left his footprints for us. He has fingerprints throughout the universe that the creation cries out to us that there is a God. You know, the Bible says every house is built by some man, but he who built all things is God. And so the creation itself screams out that there's the reality of a builder, a creator. And, and so as you look out at the universe and how orderly it is, when you look out at, at, at the world and you see that it has a, a certain uh, order to it, it, it cries out there's something beyond. There's something beyond humanity. Not only do we look at creation, but we also have the opportunity to look at our consciences, the consciences that we have, the, that we possess, that moral um, reality within us that cries out something is right and something is wrong. And that's something that, that, that the Lord has placed within us that can cry out to us, and sometimes it can accuse us, and sometimes our conscience can excuse us. There are times that you may do something that is, is, it's wounded your, your tender conscience, and, and you know you've done wrong. And there are other times that you're living a life free of any guilt and all, uh, but even so, your conscience by itself cannot present to you an, an adequate uh, revelation of God because there are some things that people do today that are wrong, but they just don't think they are. So they go out and they may steal something, and you'll ask them about it, and they'll say, well, I took it, that's true, but I was hungry, so that makes it okay. Or I went to the store, yes, that's true, and I stole this thing from the store, but they got so many other things, and by the way, they're overcharging people, and all I did is took a little bit, and it wasn't a big thing, and they're insured anyway. I used to do that all the time, and I used that as an argument. I, I worked for a company at one point. They had just started this particular store. I was hired to stock the shelves, and I was in the back there, and I was taking care of the stocking material for the men's department, and, and, and they had a lot of shirts there, and they, they, they were overpriced anyway, and they're insured, and I needed a new shirt, and, uh, or two, or three, actually. And so I ended up ripping them off, but I was able to argue all the time about it. As a matter of fact, there was a period in my life when I did that quite regularly. Walk into a store, look at a jacket, I'm cold, that's a jacket, I need one, they've got plenty here, and I'd walk out with them, and that's the way it was. And I would argue that it's okay, and if you argue with me that it wasn't, I'd say that's because you can afford a jacket, I can't. 
And so my conscience wasn't bothered by stealing at all, wasn't bothered by lying like some of you. It was just that way. That was what life was all about. And you could even argue and say it's okay. I was reading uh, just yesterday in the newspaper about a fellow who fought a uh, speeding ticket, uh, actually not a speeding ticket, he fought a ticket, he went through a red light. And because the camera that took the picture uh, was, was um, violating state code and it was in a city, in the city of Costa Mesa, I believe, he, he fought that ticket and he actually, after a year or two, won. He won uh, in his opposition to... Um, to uh, that ticket by saying that they had violated the state, uh, state uh, requirements related to photo, taking photos of your uh, license plate and all of that, and he won. And he's, he was boasting about it, if you will, in the newspaper. But the fact is, he still ran, ran the red light. He was still guilty. He found a technicality, and that's the way some people are. They'll argue, and they even present themselves as heroes, when in reality, no, they're lawbreakers. They just found a loophole. And people are that way. And your conscience, your conscience sometimes may give you permission to do something that you know is wrong, and yet you'll do it because, well, other people do it, or because the law says it's okay, or you find a loophole somewhere. And that's why you can't really rely on your conscience to reveal to you who God is. So it takes something outside. The, the nature that we see, the waves and, and, and the, the sun, the moon, the star, the, the creation per se, it screams out that there's a reality of a creator. Your conscience screams out that, that there's a, a judge that you're going to stand before one day because you have violated some cosmic rule. All of that is true, but that doesn't bring you to a knowledge of God. What brings you to a knowledge of God is the Word of God taught and the Spirit of God that brings conviction and God's revelation. So should the Lord desire to remain hidden from us, of course he would have remained hidden. He's not like, like, like my David when we would play hide and seek and my son David would go into the front room and I'd say, okay, son, I'm looking for you. And I'd go walking in the front room and my David would be seated in the center of the front room with a blanket over him. <laughs> and you'd see his little feet hanging out and he'd be laughing, and I'd come walking in, and, and I'd say, no, I know he's in here somewhere. I know, and he'd start laughing. Ah, ha, 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 ha. You know, and I'm standing right over him. I know David is hiding. He, he did this last week. He's 26. He still does this. It's an amazing thing. It's very embarrassing. He's got to stop someday. But when he was two years old, I'd walk in there, and there he would be, and I'd put my hands on my hips, and I'd say, I know he's here somewhere. You know, God's a lot better at cosmic hide-and-seek than that. And if the Lord desired to hide from us, there's no way we would ever find him. So what does he do? He reveals himself to us. The Lord reveals himself to us, and as he does so, it causes us to praise him. Verse 11 again, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all judges of the earth, both young men and maidens, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above the earth and heaven. He's exalted the horn of his people, the praise of all his saints, all the children of Israel, people near to him. And he concludes again, just praise the Lord. Praise him because he revealed himself to us. Praise him because he could have remained hidden. But in his self-disclosure, we have a life and an understanding of his forgiveness. We understand his love and we understand his mercy. As a result of that, we give thanks to the Lord. Psalm 107, verses 1 and 2 says it this way, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he's good, for his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Why do we praise the Lord? Because he's redeemed us from the hand of the enemy and because he's given to us of his spirit and the joy of knowing salvation. So we praise the Lord. Psalm 149. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song and his praise in the congregation of saints. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name with the dance. Let them sing praises to him with the timbrel and harp. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the humble with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. 
Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the peoples, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the written judgment. This honor have all his saints. Praise the Lord. So again, Psalm 149, he begins with a call to praising God. Believers are called to praise the Lord because he loves us. And it's interesting to me, he not only loves us, but notice verse 4. It says, the Lord takes pleasure in his people. The Lord takes pleasure in his people. I looked up that word pleasure. I wanted to see what is he referring to. So the Old Testament is written primarily in Hebrew, and so I looked it up in the Hebrew. I wanted to see what the word pleasure means. Because the Scripture says to me that the Lord takes pleasure in his people, and because I'm one of his people, it says by way of application that he is taking pleasure in me. But what does that mean? What does it mean that the Lord is taking pleasure in you? So the word pleasure means to delight. It speaks of uh, being affectionate. It speaks of an affectionate pleasure. It speaks of approval. And so the Lord approves and has affectionate pleasure and delights in his people. That means he delights in you if you belong to him. That means that he actually longs, if you will, I don't want to use the wrong word, he desires so a, a, a fellowship with us for whatever reason that may be. He delights in you. He loves you. He has affection for you. Can you imagine that? My grandson Josiah is here tonight. He normally doesn't come on Wednesday nights because he can't drive yet. He's only 22 months old. <laughs> but Grandma Marie got hold of the baby today. Before we came to church, she said, you know, I got to go see Josiah, you know. And she only saw him half the day today. She's got to see him the rest of it, I guess. So she said, I got to go see the grandbaby. And I said, oh, that's good. I said, I haven't seen him in two days, and I really miss him. And so you know what Grandma does is she brings him to church tonight. So I'm in the back, and I'm preparing my notes, just going over them, you know, preparing to come out. And she calls, and she says, somebody wants to see you. And I said, oh, really? And she says, and I'm bringing him right now. And so I'm there behind my desk, and I'm going over my notes and all when the door opens up a few minutes later, and, and he'll walk in, and he sees me and all of that, and he comes running around the desk and runs past me to get some gum. And, um, <laughs> and so I force him to hold me. You can have some gum if you hold me, you know. No, no hold, no gum. That's the way it is in this place. It's my office, and that's the way it's going to be. So I've got that kid in my arms, and I love him. Why am I telling you that? Because I want to. I, I'm telling you that because the Lord uses those. Those are the things that he reminds me of. I have set my affection on a little guy who doesn't even realize how deeply he's loved. I have set my affection my heart on somebody who doesn't even know the depth of my love for him. He has no clue. I sometimes will sit there and I think of him as I did with my four kids, and I still do with my four kids. And sometimes my eyes will well with tears when I just think how deeply I take pleasure in that baby. To hear his voice, you know, he called me up yesterday. Of course, he doesn't dial the phone, but his mama did. And she said, you know, I'm sorry, Dad, because I just hung up the phone with Corinne. She says, I had told Josiah that he could say hello to you. She said, and I hung up, and he's mad at me because he didn't get to say hi. And so I said, well, put him on the line. And then he starts speaking, you know, can I have the drums? No, he says... Um, <laughs> Buy me, buy me a car. Now, as we were talking, you know, he just told me about his day. He went swimming. Now, he doesn't say, I went swimming. He just uses the word wah, wah but I know what that means. And that language, you get to communicating, you begin to understand some things, the affection and the one that's being loved. And I learn things from that because I know that I don't have a clue how deeply the Lord loves me. And neither do you. You don't have a clue 
how deeply the Lord loves me. No, you don't have a clue. <laughs> it's the David show tonight. You don't have a clue how much he loves you. He loves you. And if I could only grab that, if I could only grab that and understand that, that he loves me and has set his affection on me and actually delights in me and takes pleasure in me, that would sure change my relationship with the Lord. I, I would stop being so, so works-oriented, production, methodology. If I do this, I'll get this. And it would be more fellowship. It would be just more enjoyment. It would just be more pleasure. And the Lord loves us, and the Bible makes it clear He delights in us. He sets His affection on us. Proverbs 11, verse 20 says, Those who are of a perverse heart are an abomination to the Lord, but the blameless in their ways are His delight. So the Lord loves you, and the Lord loves me. He enjoys us. He enjoys us. Even though we don't have... Uh, 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 an, a real understanding of that yet. We can't sometimes even believe that, let alone comprehend that. There's a song by a, a group. Some of you perhaps are familiar with contemporary Christian music and all, and you may be familiar with the group Casting Crowns. And there's a song by Casting Crowns that speaks to my heart. It's, it's called, Who Am I? And, and one of the, uh, the opening lines of it in their song, they say, Who am I that the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name, would care to feel my hurt? Who am I that the bright and morning star would choose to light the way for my ever-wandering heart? Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. And that's the Lord's love for us. And I think they put it very well. Who am I that, that the Lord of, of all creation knows who I am? He knows my name. Now, some of you came from backgrounds when people never even really did know your name. They would basically just say, hey, you, you know, uh, hey, you over there. And that's kind of how I was as a kid. And also, when I discovered that, that the Lord Jesus Christ actually knows his sheep by name, that meant an awful lot to me. Because I was one of these kids, like some of you in this room, that not everybody uh, knew. They didn't know my name. They knew my reputation, but they didn't know me by name. And, and for me, uh, it meant an awful lot when the Lord uh, let me know through his word that he knows me. And so he, he does that. He takes pleasure, according to verse 4. He takes pleasure in his people. Not only that, but verse 4 goes on to say, he will beautify the humble with salvation. When it says he will beautify the humble with salvation, that word beautify in the Hebrew means to adorn or to clothe. He will clothe the humble with salvation. He clothes the humble with his own righteousness. He gives to us what has been called a garment of salvation. Isaiah 61 verse 10 says this, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. The Lord has covered me with the robe of righteousness. He has given to me salvation. He beautifies the humble in that fashion. We come before the Lord in the garments that we have prepared for ourselves, in the garments that are manufactured by our own works. And our own works are just not good enough. Isaiah tells us that the works of man are like filthy rags to God. They're like when a leper had an oozing wound, they would take strips of linen, and they might wrap that linen cloth around the open wound. And as the wound would continue to to, uh, to, to ooze its, uh, you know, its contents and all, uh, and that leper would be out there in the dusty roads. It would be moistened by his uh, secretions and fluids, and then the dust and the dirt would begin to cake upon it. And God says, your righteousness is as a filthy rag. 
He's simply saying all the best things that a human being can do are never sufficient because God's requirement is never my best efforts because my best efforts are never sufficient, but God's requirement is perfection. And seeing that I as a human being am not ever going to be perfect and ever offer a perfect sacrifice, God did that for himself by giving his son Jesus Christ on our behalf. See, that's what causes me to realize how futile it is to try to somehow earn salvation by my good works. My good works will never be sufficient. They're not perfect. They're always tainted with self. Even the most generous individual who may give millions of dollars to charity uh, gives that money and wants to be known for doing it most of the time, and they get the tax breaks after doing it. Even the most generous individual very often uh, gives in a tainted way, so he gets recognition or she gets some kind of glory for it. But the Lord, what he did is he said, listen, your works aren't sufficient. There's nothing you can do that will ever be perfect. It's always going to be tainted with self-interest, and therefore, I have to do something for you that you cannot do for yourself. Now, the problem is, is you want to do it for yourself, and that's your pride. That's why he closed the humble with salvation because it requires humility on my part to say to God, I have failed. I cannot do it. I'm sorry. Forgive me for this. For a lot of people, saying, I'm sorry, I'm wrong, is extremely difficult to do because it, it, it requires humility and honesty. It requires a, a self-estimation that is based on fact and not on wish. And so a lot of people aren't willing to humble themselves. They're not willing to say, I'm sorry, not to a human being or to God. But the Bible tells us that he beautifies the humble with salvation because it's required in order to be saved. I remember a story in uh, the Gospel of Luke. You know it too. It's the prodigal son. And you remember that there was this young man, and the young man approaches his father, and he says, give to me that which is coming to me in my inheritance. I want it now. And uh, it, when he did that, in, in the Jewish culture, when a young man approaches a father and says, I want you to give me my inheritance now, it's another way of saying, I can't wait until you die, and seeing that you're not going to die for a while, I want to have what's coming to me at this moment. So when the young man actually went to his father and said, give me my inheritance, he was basically saying, I don't want to wait. I know you're going to die, but it's going to take a while, and I want the money now, so give to me what is mine. And so the father, you know the story, the father divides his inheritance and gives it to the boy, and immediately the son goes off and lives a wasteful life, and he spends his money in a way, and before you know it, it's all gone. And he's partying it up and everything, but eventually it's all gone, and now he's starving. And because he doesn't have anything, any way to supply his own, his own needs, he sells himself to somebody and begins to work for him. And, and then he starts to almost want to eat the food that it is fed to the pigs. And as he's there and he begins to think about this life and where it's gotten to him, he begins to create a, 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 some kind of a, a way to get back into his father's good graces. And, and when you study that, especially from a Middle Eastern perspective, when you study the prodigal son, you discover that what he was really doing at first was formulating a way, a plan to get back to his father's good graces without ever really having to say, I'm sorry. And so what he wanted to do is he wanted to work off his debt. And so he goes to the father, and, and, and you know the story how that he's on his way back, and the father rushes out to meet him. Now, the reason the father rushes out to meet this young man is because when the young man left that village and took off in the way that he did, it was well known amongst the people. His father was a wealthy man, well-respected, so everybody knows that his son has disrespected him. In those villages, there was a council of elders, and the elders would make a decision that if this young man were to come back, that he would be penalized severely. Now, in order to safeguard the son against what will take place to him, the father is constantly looking in the event that the son will come home. And one day, as the father's looking down this road, he sees the son, and that's why the father runs out to grab hold of the son, to get to him before the council does. Now, to see this man losing his dignity because no older man ever runs to a younger man, to see his father losing his dignity and humbling himself to the degree that he did broke the son's heart. That's why when the son begins to speak to his father, there's genuine repentance there in his words, and I don't deserve to be your son. Make me like a hired servant. But the Bible tells us 
in the book of Luke, chapter 15, verse 22 through 24, that the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him, put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, bring the fatted calf here and kill it, let us eat and be merry, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. The father said, bring out a robe and put it on him. In other words, the emblem of being my son. And the Lord God gives to us a robe when we return to him and we say to him, I have sinned against God, you, and against others. And the Lord immediately says, it's forgiven. See, that's the whole thing. If I could only humble myself, if I could only say, God, be merciful to me, I am a sinner. God will move in my life. But if I fail to do that, if I continue thinking that without him, I'm okay, then I'm not going to enjoy him, and I'm not going to enjoy salvation. In verse 5, let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. And as you love the Lord, you rejoice. You rejoice because of what he has done, and, and you even rejoice as you're laying there in bed in the morning, singing and taking pleasure in the Lord, singing aloud to him. Verse 6, let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the peoples, to bind their kings with chains, their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the written judgment. This honor have all his saints. Praise the Lord. So, it's interesting that the picture of worship and combat are actually being combined here. You praise the Lord, and yet you have a two-edged sword in your hand. Worship and combat, that's the spiritual life. But ultimately, the high praises of God and all the vengeance takes place at the very end. It takes place when the Lord Jesus Christ puts down all rebellion and deals with sin. And so, ultimately, we look forward to the time when he's going to do that, when he will execute on them judgment. And we have the opportunity of being with the Lord as he does so. And finally, Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the lute and harp. The lute would be kind of like a, a small trumpet. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals, that everything that has breath, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Well, we praise him because he's worthy of praise. We praise him not simply for what he has done. We praise him for who he is. I've been trying to make this clear, especially recently. I know this last Sunday I tried to make it clear that I think we make a big mistake when we pursue God for the things he may give to us. Instead of just for who he is to us. When a young man is pursuing a young woman and he wants to marry her and his passions begin to be inflamed by her and he desires to have a marital relationship with her, it's one of those things that the Lord allows us to have that moves us towards making a commitment in marriage so that our physical desires might be satisfied with this woman the Scripture calls uh, uh, our bride of our youth, and that she may satisfy us. And that's God's intent. And the young man, I mean, he gets married, and he is just so happy because he's able to fulfill the desires that he has in his heart in a noble and pure way. And that's how God designed marriage to be. 
And when they're married, they have their honeymoon, and their honeymoon lasts for some time. As a matter of fact, in the Old Testament, I found it interesting when I first read this many years ago that when a young man married a young woman, he actually was exempt from military service and a variety of other things for a full year. So the Scripture says so they might give pleasure to his wife. So for a year, they just were together, and they were just enjoying each other in every way, shape, and form possible, including in their physical relationships. God intends it that way. God created us in that way. God wired us in that way, especially we men to find pleasure with our wives in a physical way. And so God wires us that way. But I've discovered something. It's not that you ever cease having those desires because you, you just bless the Lord for your wife as long as you're together. And should you live to be 80, uh, 90 years old, you'll always have physical attraction in one form or another for her. And that's just the way it is. But I've discovered something. I've discovered that you might have part of the pleasure factor being the physical relationship. As you grow older, you discover so many other dimensions that bring pleasure that don't even relate to the physical. There's the quiet times that you have with one another. They're the times that you might take a walk and you don't have to say a single thing. You just are glad to be next to this person. And you, or in the morning, you wake up and you say within yourself, perhaps those of you who are married, I hope you do this once in a while. I'd like you to do this all the time. You wake up in the morning and you say, how blessed and pleased I am to be able to wake up next to this person every day. What a joy this is. The first sound in the morning is the sound of my wife, her voice, and how I love that. And what a joy that is. I love that. I love that. I enjoy it. It doesn't even have to be physical. It's just there. Or to go and grab some coffee and just to talk about your life and talk about your plans, talk about the children, talk about your grandchildren, whatever it is that you talk about, and how we have been together for so long. And all of that brings pleasure to you. All of it. And after a while, you begin to realize that the real joy that you have isn't simply the physical relationships where you've been intimate or can be intimate, but it's the fellowship that you have. It's that you've poured your life into somebody for a long time. And you can look at that person and you could almost read their minds. And you know what they're thinking at any given moment especially if you're going something together that, uh, going with the, together that you've gone through before, and you know each other, and that depth of fellowship and that depth of intimacy, and then before you know it, you realize that your love has gone beyond the physical. Your love has gone beyond that. Your love has gotten to the point where it's just that person I desire, not what we do together per se physically. It's that person I desire, that I love, that I long to hear their voice when I'm gone on a trip and I, and I call Marie, you know, just to hear her voice, just to hear her say, hi, baby, I miss you, I love you. You know, when I come home to see her face after I've been gone, that's what matters. And see, when you have a relationship with God, it's not so that, oh, boy, I'm going to get these things it, it, that's part of it, and there are certain rewards for that. But it's to know Him. It's to have relationship with Him. And when you praise the Lord, yes, He has done much for us, and yes, He's the creator of the universe, and yes, He's awesome and powerful. But we praise Him because of who He is. And when he says here in verse 1, praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty firmament, we praise him because his sanctuary is the place to worship him. The sanctuary, more than likely in this scripture here, is referring to his heavenly sanctuary, if you will. It's speaking of heaven, his throne room. But we also gather in this particular room here that we have called a sanctuary that we might worship and praise him here too. Something you might be interested in knowing, we're going to begin having um, nights of worship. Um, the first one we're going to have is going to be on a Sunday night where we're going to gather together on June 5th. And I'm going to still come out and share a little bit, but it'll be devotional and not even be the kind of study that you're used to getting verse by verse. It will be a devotional time, but we're going to spend time just worshiping and praising the Lord in song. And I'm looking forward to that just enjoying singing to the Lord and having fellowship and then having a time of prayer 
and, and just spending once a month for, um, for the three months of the summer and just doing that and see what the Lord wants to do with that so that we might praise the Lord, that we might learn as a fellowship to do that. We come with a heart filled with worship, and then we fall at his feet as we worship him. When he says in verse 2, praise him for his mighty acts, praise him according to his excellent greatness, praise him with the sound of the trumpet, praise him with the lute and harp, in other words, all these musical instruments, that's all part of our worship and praise to him. We worship and praise him. He is awesome. His power is beyond understanding, and he has the ability to save. I believe very strongly that as we worship and praise the Lord, that that's a form of testimony about how great God is. When I was 20 years old, and I don't want to give my testimony. Don't worry, I'm not going to. But I had a, a, a neat moment today in the Lord that I'll kind of share a little bit with you. When I got saved back in 1970, I got saved at the end of 1970 and began to fellowship at Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa. I used to go to the Bible study and uh, the Young People's Bible Study. My first pastor uh, that I recognized as a pastor in my life, you might find this interesting, wasn't Chuck Smith. My first person that was a pastor in my life was Lonnie Frisbee, and I don't even know if you've ever heard that name before. Lonnie was the youth pastor of Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. And I was 20 years old. I was actually 19 years old the first time I ever heard him share. And he was also 19 years old. He was a hippie from San Francisco. And uh, he had uh, come down. He hitchhiked from San Francisco, came down to Costa Mesa. And because Pastor Chuck wanted to meet a hippie, one of his daughters was dating a guy named John. And John told Pastor Chuck, I can introduce you to one. So Chuck was real excited about that. He was going to have a chance to meet a real hippie. And so the door, there's a knock at his door. There's John, and John turns and says to Pastor Chuck, Chuck, this is Lonnie. And when Chuck met Lonnie Frisbee, Lonnie Frisbee had a very charismatic way about him. I used to go to the um, Bible studies that Lonnie began to teach there at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa. It was a youth study. And I was thinking about how at one time Lonnie used to minister there and how worship ex was experienced. I was sharing with, with a couple people today, my secretary as well as Mike, my administrator, how that I can still remember we would go and we would be seated in a sanctuary that was built to seat, I forget, two to three hundred people. But the sanctuary was filled every every. The pews were all completely filled, and the aisles were filled with bodies all the way to the foyer. And then the foyer doors were opened up, and the kids used to hang there at the doors looking in. Eventually, what they had to do was take the walls out. They took one of the walls out on the side there, on the right side, and they put glass there. And then they put speakers outside, and we could sit, because if you got, late, got there late, there was no way you were going to get in the building and we could look in through that glass and hear the Bible study. And I was remembering today because I saw a picture of Lonnie, and I was remembering today how I got there early one time, and I was seated there in a pew next to the aisle, and how Lonnie used to stand. He didn't stand on the platform. He would stand there amongst us, and he'd hold his Bible. He didn't use any notes. He'd just read, and he would talk to us. And I remember this one particular instance that he was reading the Scriptures, and I heard something going on behind me, directly behind me, in the aisle. I still remember turning around and looking, and there was a tall blonde kid with long, stringy blonde hair who had stood up as Lonnie was teaching, and he started to cry. He was probably in his late teens, maybe early 20s, and he started to cry. As he started to cry, he started rubbing his eyes with his hands. As he was rubbing his hands and his eyes with his hands, he stumbled, and he was stumbling past people. Everything became absolutely quiet for just a moment until he finally threaded his way past me. I was only three rows from the front, past me. And then he grabbed hold of, of Lonnie, and when he grabbed him, he just erupted in tears. 
And I remember because I was sitting at an angle looking at Lonnie, his, the surprise, he had a surprised look in his face. And he began to pat this guy on the back. Now, Lonnie was 19 or 20 years old, and he was patting him on the back. And he put his arm around his shoulder, and I remember him walking off to the side and then coming back and looking at us. As he walked away, somebody in the, in the congregation said, pray. So all the kids were just praying. We were all praying. God, we don't know what's going on, but whatever it is, Lord, do something for this guy. And I'll never forget, and I was telling this story to, to the guy, to Mike and to Dina today. I'll never forget Lonnie walking back and standing there, and we're all waiting to hear what happened. And he said to us, loneliness is a terrible thing. That's all he said. Loneliness is a terrible thing. When we were in church there, we were learning to worship and praise the Lord. We were learning that there is a God who loves us and cares for us, a God who answers prayer and transforms lives, a God who is as close as your heartbeat, who can hear you when you think and when you whisper. We were learning that there is a God who cares, who did something about our lost condition he reached down from heaven, if you will. He took upon himself human form. He dwelt amongst us and went through the things that we go through so that we might have a knowledge of a God who loves, who's merciful, who's kind, who's compassionate, a God who forgives sin, a God who has relationship with you. We learned that. I learned that at the age of 20. I learned that when I gave my heart to the Lord and he forgave me all of my sins. I learned that when I walked into a sanctuary at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, and they had the guitars, and they had the drums, and they had the loud cymbals, and they played worship and praise to God. I learned that. So Psalm 150 has always been, in my life, a powerful psalm because it speaks about the power of worshiping a powerful God, a God who loves you, a God who's near to you, a God who cares for you, a God who deserves to be worshipped. And that's what God has called us to do, guys, is to worship him. Why? Why should I worship him? Because he loves me, because he gave his son for me, because he rescues me every day, because he provides for me, because he's given to me a, a life that is blessed and joyful, because he's good. That's why I worship him, because he's creator, because he's master, because he's awesome, because he's powerful. That's why I worship him. How do I worship him? I praise him. I sing to him. I speak to him. I fall on my face before him. I cry to him. I complain to him. I rejoice in him. He's my friend. He's your friend too. He's the only one who will put up with your complaints, by the way. And, and he listens to you, and he loves you, and he provides for you. So we praise him. We praise him in his sanctuary. We praise him when we're on our bed at night going to sleep, and we say, God, thank you so much for this day. We praise him in the morning when we wake up, and we say, Lord, thank you for the new day that you've given to us. We praise him when we ask, God, could you please help me because you know there's something wrong in my life that only you can fix. We praise him when our children aren't doing well because we know God loves them more than we do. And we praise him when they're doing well because it's all because of him that they are doing well. And we learn to praise him just because he deserves it. And may we as a church learn to praise the Lord.